Compared to the gas giants, rocky planets are the easiest to explore. They're also the closest. In the past 60 years of space exploration, we have successfully landed on the planet 18 times and orbited them over 26 times. Yet, out of all these explorations, Mercury was almost not orbited. Its proximity to the sun made it a very difficult target, even for just orbiting. Despite this, one spacecraft did make it into orbit around this barely explored planet. And with that mission, we were able to explore a whole new environment, an environment that has been exposed to extreme heat, radiation, and strong gravitational fields for over 4.5 billion years. This could give us some insight into what the Earth might become in about 5 billion years when our sun turns into a red giant and grows to consume Mercury and Venus. Maybe Mercury is trying to tell us something about our future. Maybe there's a message in the data. This short rant is going to be about the Messenger spacecraft's journey to Mercury, the only spacecraft to have orbited Mercury as of 2019. This is a rant and not a story or a documentary because I'll cover multiple topics in varying details that may or may not be directly related to Messenger. But the general idea is to talk about the spacecraft and its journey to Mercury and maybe, just maybe, entertain you a little bit. This is a two-parter. So as some famous YouTuber would say, let's get started. For a planet named after the messenger of the gods, Mercury is pretty hard to find with the naked eye. Of the five closest planets from Earth, it's the most difficult to spot. That's right. It's harder to find than Saturn, which is 10 times further away. But then again, Saturn is about 24 times bigger. So there is that. Obviously, with a telescope, it's easy to find Mercury and not confuse it with a star. It's not that hard. Galileo pulled this off in the 1600s, so even a $100 telescope will work. You just have to know where to look. So, if it's not hard to spot and relatively close, why is it the third least explored planet in the entire solar system? It's the sun's fault. Everything is the sun's fault. If your planet is far and cold, that's because it doesn't get enough sunlight. If your planet is far and hot, that's because it's trapping too much of the sun's light. If your planet no longer has a sizable atmosphere, guess why that is? That's because the radiation from the sun has blown it away. So, it's no surprise that the issue relating to the difficulty of exploring Mercury is also related to the sun. In this case, it's too close to it. If you're thinking it's because of the heat from the sun, don't, just don't. We can take the heat. After all, people live in cities across the world with temperature of up to 55 degrees Celsius. Now, that's nothing compared to the 430 degrees Celsius on the surface of Mercury, but that's just to show that humans can't stand the heat and will stay in the kitchen, if you know what I mean. Even if that kitchen is your entire city. And besides, the Parker Solar Probe at its nearest approach to the sun will have stood over 1300 degrees Celsius. I'll do a video on the Parker Solar Probe in the future. In any event, heat is not the real issue. The issue is the mass of the sun. Actually, the issue is the gravity caused by the mass of the sun. At the distance of Mercury's orbit, the acceleration caused by the sun is 6.7 times stronger than at the distance of Earth's orbit. Granted, it's still only 0.04 meters per second squared compared to the 9.8 meters per second squared that Earth exerts on all of us, it's still strong enough to destabilize any spacecraft in orbit around Mercury relatively quickly. In addition, Mercury has a high orbital velocity than Earth, so a spacecraft has to be moving around 47 kilometers per second to orbit the Sun at the distance of Mercury. A prerequisite for orbiting Mercury, I'd say. That's 17 kilometers per second faster than that of Earth. Surprisingly, as the spacecraft moves towards Mercury, it's also moving towards the sun. So the entire time it's accelerating and it will get to that 47 kilometers per second speed and keep getting faster and faster. Too fast and too furious to be pulled into orbit by Mercury. Okay, enough about Mercury. We're here to talk about the Messenger Pro and how it ultimately managed to orbit Mercury in light of the difficulties listed. So once again, 
let's get started. By the late 1980s, we had relatively detail on all planets in our solar system, except for Mercury. We also had almost no detail on the planet I shall not name, because it's no longer a planet. So Mercury was the only planet holding out. Mariner 10 did a good job in 1974-75, but didn't stick around long enough to map the entire planet. It got about 45% before running out of juice. So as time went by, scientists wanted to rematch. And this time, they were going to go there to stay. Round 2. Fight! Yeah. Going back to stay seems to be a reoccurring theme in space exploration. To be fair though, going back to stay in this context means to orbit a planet, even if it's just for a little while. In any event, this going back started in 1998, when a detailed proposal about a mission to Mercury was sent to NASA to be selected as part of its discovery program. NASA's discovery program is a series of low-cost, highly focused space missions designed to explore the solar system. For example, the Pathfinder mission from 1997 was part of the Discovery Program. The need to keep the cost down was one reason that Pathfinder used airbags for its final phase of its landing, instead of retro rockets like previous landers. This is in contrast to NASA's flagship missions, or Large Strategic Science Missions as they're now called. I like the term flagship better. Sounds more serious. Sounds like something you don't want to lose. And rightfully so. Each flagship mission costs at least half a billion dollars, with the real, real ones like the Hubble Space Telescope and the Parker Solar Probe costing more than one billion dollars. But back to MESSENGER. It was within these constraints of the Discovery Program that the MESSENGER mission was born. So right out of the gate, this mission was not going to be a straightforward one. It had to be light enough so it could be launched by a rocket that's within the Discovery's program budget. Delta II Heavy is the most powerful in that program. So, its lifting capacity puts a hard limit on the amount of scientific payload that messengers could carry. It also put a limit on how much fuel could be on board messenger. It's a trade-off between scientific payload and fuel. Actually, it's not. If you don't have enough fuel to get where you're going, your scientific instruments will have to be repurposed for something else. But that's not how these missions work. Each instrument is designed to function best in its intended environment. Sure, it'll still work out of that environment, but it'll be like filming a wedding with a CCTV camera instead of a DSLR. Your data just won't look good. Vida Sassoon. The bottom line is this. These instruments are useless if you don't make it to your destination. Fuel is king. That's not entirely accurate. A Japanese spacecraft ran out of usable fuel after a failed attempt to orbit Venus. It ended up orbiting the Sun for five years until it crossed paths with Venus again, and engineers were able to get into orbit around Venus using only the attitude control thrusters. These thrusters are weak, so they had to burn them long and hard. It worked. However, the new orbit was highly elliptical. But then again, ask any astronomer, any real astronomer, it doesn't matter if your orbit is circular or highly elliptical. Orbiting is orbiting. Well, with that said, the mass of MESSENGER was 54% fuel. But even with that amount of fuel, 600 kilograms to be exact, MESSENGER wouldn't be able to slow down enough to be captured by Mercury. Engineers had to come up with a way to lose the excess speed without burning fuel they don't have. Luckily for them, a solution was found for most part in 1998, six years before the launch of MESSENGER. We'll go into detail of the solution in part two of this video. But for now, here's a short version of the solution. Two part Venus, one part Earth, and three parts Mercury. That's the message of solution. I'm DexDFX for the Celestial Sphere.